Yeah, welcome to my fourth lecture in this RFM course. I see slightly more people here than last time. Today we will talk about measuring dependency structures of financial assets. And today this will be actually the last, uh, let's say, real lecture. All right, so the, in the last lecture, in the fifth lecture, we will talk about some we will summarize what we have learned here a little bit, and we will, uh, I will give you some, some examples for the assignment and how to solve the questions, right? So uh, let's get started here. So from uh, basic finance or from basic econometrics, you might have encountered this so-called autoregressive model. So the question is, okay, how do we model or measure dependency structures in traditional finance research, yeah? So, and we have different kinds of, of models that you, that you also learn or should learn in, in, in econometrics classes. And for instance, the, the autoregressive framework is usually the first example where you, where you start with. And what we see here, yeah, you can think of YT as the return of some financial asset, right? And we have an intercept term, A0 plus lags of that asset. Huh? So yt minus 1 is the, re is the lag return, lag by, by one period. Huh? It's the return of on, uh, at time t minus 1. yt minus 2 is the return of that asset at time t minus 2. So you lag it. And we can lag it capital M times. Yeah? So, and that is called an autoregressive model of order M. Yeah? And we have obviously then M plus 1 parameters to estimate. Uh, including this intercept term, this is A0. So how do we estimate that model? Well, we can just, you can, you can use some standard software or you can just program it. Uh, you can use simple OLS regression technique yeah, to, to estimate the, the point estimates. We have then also moving average models. They are slightly different. Yeah? So what we see here is yeah, you lag the error terms. Yeah? Because if we just move, move back here, we, of course, because that's a regression model, we have to include an, an, indice, uh, an error term here, yeah, the epsilon t. Yeah. So that's the white noise process, and us usually assumed to be distributed uh, as normal with mean zero. And here, so here you lack the, what is on the left-hand side for the autoregressive models, but for the moving average models, you do not lack what is on the, on the left-hand side, you lack what is on the right-hand side. Here, you lack the error terms itself. So the, outer, the, the uh, dependency structure here stems from the residual process itself. Yeah? So and here, obviously, we have a different point estimate. So here, here we have, it, we have the, the intercept term B0 and B1 until Bn, which measures the exposure to the lagged residuals, yeah? And then we can combine these two processes, and then, then we are in the class of ARMA processes. Okay, the ARMA process here, very general form, ARMA MN model, yeah? Where we have M, uh, outer regressive elements, right? Uh, and we have N, moving average elements. And now, all of a sudden, Okay, it's, it, I make calculation. Okay, so I, I made a calculation in the background here, and now I obviously my computer pays more attention to MATLAB than to PowerPoint. So that's that's a good thing. So, but let's let's move it back here. So uh, these ARMA models, okay, you combine the outer regressive models and the moving average models together. Whereas we estimate RM models simply by OLS, uh, these moving average models, uh, they are, are nonlinear. Also, the ARMA models, they are nonlinear, and so we have to estimate it via nonlinear estimation procedures, such, such as the Newton Refson algorithm, for instance. Yeah, but standard software like, like eViews can, can do that. So, and what is also interesting to note that actually these kind of models here, the ARMA model, uh, the, the, the autoregressive model, and the moving average model, they are sort of relatives to each other, okay? Even if you, if you would uh, plot, if you would estimate or if you would simulate 
the moving average model or our regression model is difficult for the visual, like for the, for, for the human eye to distinguish between these kind of models. It's very, it's very difficult. So um, that's why what, what people usually do, they, they, they run ARMA models okay, on some data and then they investigate uh, which of the point estimates are significant. Okay. So one can show actually that if we just take the autoregressive model of order one, where we just have the, the, the yt equal to a0 plus a1 times yt minus 1 and, and the error term, we can show that this autoregressive auto model of order 1 can be transformed into a moving average process of, of, of infinite order. Uh, so uh, because I have no whiteboard here, <laughs> we could make it there, but it would, it, you can just do it by yourself, okay? and uh, at home as, as, as a homework. Maybe I asked it in the assignment, okay? So, so uh, that's actually quite, quite simple. You just lag it by, do we lag this here by one term? Yeah, then you have, in the next equation, it's yt minus one is equal to what? A zero plus a one times yt minus two plus et minus one. Yeah, to plug it into the first equation, okay? And to do it iteratively, okay? And then you will see that as we have infinite, um, um, as 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 uh, we have t minus infinity, okay, this 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 term here disappears, and we have just a, a, a long series of of, of lag error terms in that equation. So that is what we usually what is the foundation of traditional uh, finance research, and hopefully, uh, when we will come soon, you will, you will soon recognize why that is so. So what I have done here, yeah, so I have now here modeled, I've simulated uh, autoregressive model of order one. So let's keep things simple, okay? Now we, we, we just focus on the, on the simplest form, yeah, and that's the autoregressive model of order one. So it must be this, and I, as you see here, I, 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 don't, I, I don't even um, include the intercept term here, okay? I just have the, what is on the left hand side, yt is equal to a times yt minus one, as simple as that, and the error term here. And of course, so that this process here doesn't explode, we require that this parameter here that measures the, 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 the first order autocorrelation must be between minus one and one. If that would be larger than one, it would be an explosive process. So, and also in the traditional form in finance, everything is normally distributed, all right? So this, this error term here is normally distributed with mean zero and standard deviation of one, or variance of one. So on here, I, I set this autocorrelation parameter equal to minus 0.9, and I simulate 2,000 drawings of that process. And this is what you see here. That's, that's the time series evolution of that process. And, and what do we see is that it always bounces back. Yeah, once we had a, let's say we had a, in one period, let's say we had a high, a large positive standard deviation. Let's say 3.5 or, or, or 4, okay? Remember, 6 we, we don't see in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the Gaussian world, so 4 is already pretty, pretty large standard deviation. In the next process, this process will be 0 point, uh, minus 0 0.9 times 4, it's, so it's minus 3.6, right, plus some noise term here, which is on expectation zero, yeah? So if we had in, in one period a, a negative standard deviation, let's say minus, minus four, then the next period it will be minus, minus, yeah? So it will be positive, it will be plus 3.6 and some noise. If we had a large standard deviation of, of let's say, four, the next period it will be minus 3.6 plus some noise. So, so it always bounces back. Large positive st standard deviations are on average followed by large negative st standard deviations. Yeah? It's, it always bounces back to the, to the mean immediately. Or, yeah. And this is called anti-persistence. It always bounces back. It, it keeps track to, to, to itself. And what we see here, and obviously this is sort of a boundary case, okay? Because it, it should not be below minus one. 
So, so minus 0 0.9 is, is already a boundary case, let's say, for this kind of, of, of processes. Otherwise, it would not be stationary. Yeah? So, but we, this is what we always want to, re want to have in, in, uh, in, in our data. Yeah? We want to have stationary, stationary processes that, that circulate around some, some mean, and, the, and the, where the variance is somehow bounded. So uh, here I, I plot that series. First of all, I standardize it. So, so what do I do? So each, ob each single observation here, I subtract the sample mean and divide it by the sample standard deviation. And what I get is the standardized process. So this process here does not have a variance of one. Okay? You, you see here six, seven sigma events. Okay? We, would not, uh, we should not observe that here if this would be a Gaussian process with standard deviation one. So we have to standardize that so that it becomes a process that has a mean zero and the variance of one so that we can compare it with the standard normal. And this is what I have done here. And here I, I plot these two processes here uh, against each other. So the, the uh, blue line here is the standard normal. And uh, of course, I here, I have in the description of, the, of this graph, I have the first order autocorrelation auto parameter is equal to zero. Yeah, but obviously, this implies, if you see this formula here, okay, if that is zero here, what remains is just the, the white noise process, yeah? the, the normal distribution. So, and the other process here is the, is the, uh, the, 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 the red line here is again like in the, the standardized uh, anti-persistent autocorrelation process with uh, parameter minus 0.9. Yeah, and, and what we see here is there's obviously this, 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 this blue graph here, there's no predictability. It's the white noise. But the red line here, the red graph, you see predictable patterns here. Yeah? Because obviously it clusters. Yeah? Whenever there's a, there's, a, there's a large event, it's followed by a, by a large event, and so on. Yeah, so, it, so it clusters. So there's predictability. So now I give you the opposite point of view. Now we, I, I, I put this outer correlation parameter equal to 0.9, which is again the, 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 the upper boundary for that kind of process. And, and again, I simulate 2,000 drawings. And here, so if we have now one, a process that has a standard deviation that, that has, let's say, a, 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 four, a four sigma event, yeah, four standard, standard deviations away from, from the mean, in the next period, it will be 3.6 standard deviations away from the mean, but in, in, the, in the positive direction, plus some, some noise. So large events are followed by large events on average. So that's why, you see, whenever this process here is far, far away from the center, it remains there for some time until it bounces back. Because it needs a large negative standard deviation to go into the other uh, direction. Yeah? So we have here a high level of persistency in the data. That's a positive autocorrelation. And in the next slide, uh, yeah, what I do here is again, I standardize the uh, first order autocorrelation auto process to have a mean of zero and the standard deviation equal to one, and I plot it against the normal distribution. Again, here, the blue line here is the normal distribution, and the red line here, the red graph, shows the evolution of this uh, autocorrelated process with autocorrelation parameter 0.1. Yeah, again, we see here predictable patterns arise in the presence of, of first order autocorrelation, okay? Because we see whenever the process is, is here, and above, the, and above the mean, it will remain there for some time until it bounces back. Persistency. Again, whenever you have the situation in, in financial, if you, if you would observe this in, in financial assets, you, you, you could trade on it. And you would earn money. So now you may wonder, okay, what has that, all this to do with finance? Because we are here in finance, right? So it's, Again, YT, think of it as a, as a return of a, of a financial asset, of a stock, for instance. 
We can have then this, this model here. Yeah? So we, let's say we take 12 lakhs of that financial asset into account. Yeah? So we, regress, we, we, we can regress the returns of an, of an asset on a constant and 12 lakhs from itself. And again, because this is a regression model, we have to include here an, intercept term, uh, an error term. So what we know is, so that this asset is stationary, the sum of these estimates here against the lags should be either, it should be between, something between minus one and, and one. Right? Otherwise, again, the process would sort of explode. And again, we can assume, or people usually assume, that this yt is normally distributed with some mean, mu, and uh, sigma squared. So what we can do now, okay, we can now, def we, we can now define the uh, parameter b that summarizes, that basically takes the sum of all of these parameters a1 to a12. Yeah? So the, the, point, the, the, the parameters measuring the exposures against the lags. And of course, for B, the same must hold. So B should be something between minus one and one. So the asset pricing literature proposes asset return predictability using that model here. Yeah? So we, we can, if we, if we regress the return of a stock on the Cumulative on, on the cumulative return, which, which is what you see here, of the past 12 months, because that's the cumulative return, yeah, the sum from m is 1 until 12, and we lag, and we lag it here. Yeah, it's a sum from yt minus 1, yt minus 2, plus yt minus 3, and so on. It's the cumulative sum of the past 12, re, of the past 12 months returns, if we have monthly data. So if we do that, yeah, the literature suggests that the point estimate B, so if you run this regression model here, should be positive. Yeah, and that's what? That's the momentum effect. Yeah. So the, the cumulative return over the past 12 months should predict the, the, the future return. And that <coughs> here should be positive. Because past winner stocks should outperform past loser stocks, right? So that's what the momentum effect is all about. If you do that for S&P 500 stocks, yeah, so that's on average significant, positive. And another popular example is the short-term reversal effect. Okay, and it's even a simpler model. Yeah, you just run the simple R1 model. Okay. So you, you regress the returns, the return of, of a stock on its lag returns. Yeah? And what you would expect? You would expect that this A1 should be negative. Yeah? Because why? Because the short-term reversal effect tells us that, that stocks, that, that, that loser stocks in the current months will outperform the winner stocks in the current months. The stocks that, so if you form a portfolio of stocks that have performed very poorly, like the, that had the, the lowest returns in that month, they should generate in the next period higher returns than the portfolio of stocks consisting of the winner stocks from that month. So that's the short-term re reversal effect. And, and again, if you do this for all stocks, let's say for S&P 500 stocks here, for 500 stocks, then on average, this guy here should be negative. For single stocks, okay, for single stocks, not for the stock index, for single stocks. So is this clear to everybody? So that's, that's dependency, that's, that's how you measure dependency uh, of financial assets. Yeah? So you use basically autocorrelation kind of methods here. Uh, here I, I gave you one example so that's, that's one, one data set that I, that I got my hands on, okay, so to speak. So I used the uh, monthly Dow Jones 30 return from May 1896 until April 2022. I have uh, 1,494 observations here. 
And I run this simple first order autocorrelation model here. Okay? You see here, same equation in the previous slide. And again, like most finance scholars, uh, I assume, or here it is assumed that this error term here is normally distributed with mean uh, mu and some deviation sig uh, sigma squared. So if I run this regression model here, what you see is here the EVU's output yeah, for the point estimates. The C here gives us the point estimate for the, for the intercept term here, the, the C, and this is the, the coefficient is 0.57% per month okay, re return. And this is not the, the raw return, okay? It's not the excess return. Uh, and the t-statistic is 4.16. So based upon the t-statistic, okay, you would infer that the Dow Jones 30 index, okay, generated so and so and so much percent payoff per month in that sample period. The point estimate against lag Dow Jones 30 returns is 0.055. A1, the point estimate for A1 is 0.055 with a t-statistic of 2.15 in rounded figures. The p-value is 0.03. So what does it mean? So it means in this regression model here, whenever the return of the Dow Jones 30 was positive in the, pre in the previous months, you would expect it to be 0.055% higher in the next period. So that's just, so if you, in an index, from an index perspective, the reversal effect is of course reversed, right? Because it, it somehow uh, accounts for this in the index composition. Yeah, so if you take a single stock index, this, this guy should be negative, but if you take the, if you run that, that model for the whole index, it should be positive. And that's exactly what you see here. So what's the distribution of these error terms here? That's now the interesting thing, because this autoregressive model here uh, assumes that this guy here is normally just distributed. So if we see, if we check the, uh, if we, let's have a look here on the, on the distribution of the regression errors, and what we see here is, okay, mean is, should be zero, and that's obviously here the case, because it must be zero by default. Okay, this is how the regression model works, okay? It, 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 it minimizes the, the sum of squared Residuals here, okay, so it must be zero by construction. Standard deviation is 5.26, skewness close to zero, kurtosis 8.68. So what's the kurtosis of the normal distribution? It's three. Okay, so this is, has, has a much higher kurtosis than the, than the normal distribution. And the Jacques Berra test here, this is a test that we use in order to test if the data is normally distributed or not. So whenever the, the Jacques Berra test here gives you a probability, a, a p-value that is larger than 0.05, okay, you would not reject the normal distribution as the underlying distribution of that process. So, it's, so this, this Jacques Berra test or the JB test has under the, assumes under the null hypothesis that the data is normally distributed. And when you reject the JB test, you, you would reject the null hypothesis of normally distributed data. And this is also what, what you do here. Data is not normally distributed. The p-value is zero. So now I, I, I do a very simple sample split test. That's also something that I can recommend you for your, for, for your master thesis project, okay? Whenever you, you have some, some sample and you have, some, you have come up with something, uh, you should somehow, somehow show that this is not specific to that sample period. So even, in, that's, 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 quite, that's quite interesting. So if you, uh, there, there's a paper out there in the Journal of Finance, okay, you know, it's the sort of best journal or what people think it's the best journal uh, of, uh, in financial economics. So there, there, there's a paper uh, entitled Volatility Managed Portfolios, okay? This paper has uh, many citations. So, and, and they, they, the authors, what they show is, okay, if you, if you volatility manage risk factors, if I'm on French risk factors and the, or the momentum factor, um, what happens then is that you get a higher payoff. Okay, it, it increases the, the, the uh, we, can have, we can have a look here uh, on the whiteboard. Whiteboard is always good. It should be actually there, the whiteboard. I, I have no, I no idea why it's here. 
So if we have sigma and mu, so what it does is this volatility managing, it increases, it moves the, the efficient frontier to the upwards. Okay? The efficient portfolio, once you account for volatility managing, it gives you a higher, a higher payoff for each level of risk. You know, this, is, this is what they, what they argue in, in the study. Okay? The problem is just, okay, and, and they do that only for the whole sample. But if you would do a subsample test, you would figure out in the, uh, in the latest sample, in the most recent subsample, there's no effect. Zero. It's just sample specific. It's driven by the first subsample. And something similar you see here. So we have the first subsample and the latest subsample, the recent, recent subsample. In the first subsample, we have almost the same significance, okay? The t statistic for the uh, A1 parameter yeah, is 2.11, indicating on a, on a, on a standard 5 percent level, you would, you, um, you would argue, all right, the short term reversal effect exists. But here, in the second subsample, the p value is 0.78. You know, there is no effect. So this whole short term re reversal effect is specific to the first subsample. In the, in the latest subsample, there is no such effect. So if you would have had the glorious idea to, to build a trading strategy using this on, on the short term reversal effect, and you have only that data here, available and you would run this, this kind of strategy, you wouldn't end up bankrupt very, very fast if you rely on that data, right? I'm sure some hedge funds have done that. So what's the problem here? And we talked about it earlier in this course because this is what the course is all about actually. So what's the problem here? So how, how is the, 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 the A1 hat because head is because it's, it's an estimate, okay? What's the definition? How is it defined? It's defined as the covariance of the Dow Jones and the lag Dow Jones, divided by the variance of the lag Dow Jones. And the variance of the lag Dow Jones is the same like the variance of the Dow Jones, okay? In essence. You see here, uh, this guy here, A1. How is it defined? And it's defined as the covariance between Dow Jones and Dow Jones, and the lag Dow Jones divided by the variance of the Dow Jones in lags. So if the variance of what is here in the denominator is undefined, it means the parameter A1 is undefined. It doesn't exist. Of course, if you have a sample, you will always get some estimate. Okay? You, you will always get some estimate for the covariance, and you will always get some estimate for the variance, but the sample estimates are not informative because they do not reflect the true underlying process. Because in the true underlying process, that guy here is not defined. And because this guy here is not defined, that's not, that's not, that's not defined either. Because we know that the covariance, we, we can ex express it in terms of the correlation and variances, right? Or standard deviations. So in the worst case, okay, this is what what, uh, what Mandelbrot figured out for, for cotton price changes. This guy here is obviously not, not defined, okay? So this model does not work out at all. Uh, but we have seen in the last lecture for S&P 500, for instance, variance, the theoretical variance is defined, but the variance of variance is not defined. So if the variance of variance, is, so if the variance of lagged Dow Jones 30 returns is undefined, it means that the point estimate alpha uh, A hat 1, given the information set omega S, is not the same like the point estimate given the information set omega T. And now we, we say, okay, the information set omega S is a, sub, is a subset of the information set omega capital T, which is the whole information set. And, this, and the reason for that is obviously because what is in the denominator here is not the same. Yeah. 
that in each sample you will get a different, a, a different estimate. So, and for practical purposes, uh, what's the variance of variance? So, it, for, for practical purposes, we can think of it as the kurtosis of the Dow Jones 30. Yeah? So, remember last time uh, when we had the last lecture about the second moment of financial assets, okay, we were modeling directly the, 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 the asset market uncertainty in terms of the, of the range based variance estimator. Yeah? We directly investigated the distribution. Of the, of the variances. But of course, we can also uh, go, go back to the, re, to the um, return series and, and, and estimate the moments from the return data. Yeah? So, and what is the second moment for the variance data is the fourth moment for return data. But I told you already, okay, why did I do that? Why did I use a range-based uh, variance estimators in, 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 in order to model the, the data generating process of the variances? Well, because literature argued that the information using range, uh, in, intraday range based variance estimators, there's a higher level of information than in simple returns. Okay? So you might, get, you, you, you might come up with different conclusions. So and now, okay, we know, okay, a correlation is maybe a, a, a poor measure for, for uh, measuring dependency structures of financial assets. We can have a, another look on dependency structures. So here, I gave you just a, a simple example, okay, we, uh, how, to, how to derive the normal distribution from a simple t coin, coin tossing game. Okay? If you toss a coin, probability 50%, open 5 that you have head, and probability 0.5 that you have tail, right? So it's 50-50 probability. In the first game, I toss a fair coin 100 times. Fair coin means, okay, probability is 50% for either. Uh, if, if it shows me head, I win one dollar or one euro or one finish mark. You can, it doesn't matter, the unit doesn't matter. And, and if tail, then I lose one dollar. And I repeat that game, uh, uh, the same game, thousand times. And then I calculate the, the uh, total win for each of, of these games. So what you see here is the distribution after I repeated that game thousand times. Okay? So you, you see here I have samples from one to thousand, to thousand times. And you see the maximum output that I received here is... 30. The minimum is minus 38. And the kurtosis is 3.13. Skewness is close to zero. And here we see here that the Jack Berra test it has a value of 2.8 and it does not reject the null hypothesis. Okay? That this data here is normally distributed. The p value is 0.24. So this data upon this simple game gives me a normal distribution. And of course, it does not look like this bell shape, bell, a bell-shaped curve because I would, have, I would need infinite many games in order to get this, this uh, smooth-looking bell-shaped curve. Yeah? So, but now remember the maximum is here uh, 30 and the minimum is minus 38, which you see here. Maximum is 30 and uh, minimum is minus 38. The payoff. So now I, I play the same game basically, but now I toss a game not 100 times, I, I, I toss a coin 10,000 times. So 100 times my initial sample. 100 times 100, 10,000. And I, I do this again 1,000 times in order to have some comparability here. So now I see, okay, and again, we can have a look here at the JB test, 0.53. The p-value is 0.76, so it does not reject the normal distribution. So this data here is normally distributed. But now I see the maximum is 314, and the minimum is minus 296. If we compare it with the previous figures, it's approximately 10 times that, right? 
it's approximately 10 times what I had earlier. And that's, of course, not coincidence. It's roughly 10 times, or approximately 10 times larger than in the previous game. The spread between maximum and minimum. And 10 is what? It is the square root of 100. And 100 is the factor with which I expand my sample. From the initial sample, okay? Initially I had 100 point courses, and next time I had 10,000 point courses. So the factor is 100. That's no coincidence. So I, now I, what I did here is I, I did a simulation experiment, and this is usually the way how you can easily uh, visualize things or make it understandable for yourself if you just simulate it. So I, I have here uh, 10,000, okay, this is, this is one, one, one payoff, it, it should visual, uh, uh, visualize the evolution of, uh, of the payoffs, okay, when I have when, I, when I'm running 10,000 point courses, okay? So, and now we see here, in the first 100 observations of the point causing game, the maximum payoff that I, that I would receive here is minus one, and the minimum is minus 23. So, so the range between maximum and minimum is what? It's minus one, minus, minus 23 is 24. It's the spread between minimum and maximum here in the, in the first 100 observations of, of that game that lasts 10,000 uh, toying courses. If we consider the whole time series path of these 10,000 toying courses, we can see so well, that's the local maximum or minimum given 100 observations, but the global maximum and minimum, we, we, can, we can also calculate, and that's here, the maximum, the global ma um, uh, maximum that is reached here in, in that game is 55, whereas the minimum is minus 69. Again, I can compound the spread. What's the spread here between global maximum and minimum is 124. And 124, so the, 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 the maximum and minimum here <coughs> in the beginning is, or the, the, the other way around. So, so the, the global spread between maximum and minimum is equal or less than 10 times the spread between maximum and minimum in the first 100 observations. Right? And again, this, this 100 is the f factor how I, that I use to expand my sample of the initial 100 observations. So I move from 100 to 10,000, okay? That's a factor of 100. The square root of that is 10. So this minimum and maximum here, the global, is equal or less than 10 times what is here in the beginning. Yeah. I give you an, another example. Again, it, this is another iteration of that game. Here, in this iteration, the maximum is 1 and the minimum is 16 in the first 100 observations. Okay? The spread between maximum and minimum here in the beginning is what? It's 17. If I take the global maximum and, and minimum, it's 66 is the maximum, the minimum is minus 49. So the, so the spread, the global spread is 115. And 115 is equal or less 10 times the spread from the initial observations here. So we see it's, it's, it's bounded, okay? It's, it's, it's not more than 10 times the range between maximum and minimum that I observe here in the beginning of, of the sample. And that's only the case if, if this is a fair game. So if the, if the likelihood, or if the, if the coin, coin is fair, which means that the likelihood of, 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 uh, of, of, of tail is the same like, like for head. 
if the game is memoryless. Only then this holds. So I can make predictions. So if I, if I have a, a certain sample and I know, and I would know, that this process is, is memoryless, I knew what outcomes I can expect if I expand the sample. Just by, by knowing this, this spread here in the beginning. So, so now we can make it more, more general. And this is also, I have, uh, it, it slightly, I changed it slightly the description here. So uh, I might upload the, the new or the, 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 the changed slides on Moodle later, later on. So for independent processes, the range between maximum and minimum increases by the square root of the factor of the sample expansion. Knowing this, we can compute the multiplication factor, which tells us by what factor we need to multiply the range, maximum and minimum, from the first part of the sample, let's say first 100 observations. If you want to know the corresponding expected range for the extended sample, let's say if I extend the sample from 100 to 10,000 observations. So the slope of that curve is, is, is the square root of the relation from the expanded sample to the beginning of the sample, the initial sample, yeah? or 0 0.5. 0 0.5 is, is, is the square root. So that's the slope of that line here. So we see here, for, for 10,000 observations, it's, it's 10. The factor is 10, like we had in, in, in our example here. So initial sample, in, in, in our previous example, the, 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 the initial sample H was 100. Yeah? The sample is equal to 10,000. 10,000 over 100, so the extension factor is 100, and the range between minus uh, be high uh, and low should, be, should not exceed the square root of, of 100. Yeah? So, so that's, that's how we can think about it. And that is only true if the process is memoryless. For instance, the S&P 500. The S&P 500 should be an example for a memoryless process. Okay, if, if, if the S&P 500 would have uh, predictable patterns, okay, then you could earn money. But if you, if you apply that for the S&P 500, what you should get out is that uh, the slope of that line should be close to 0.5, or it should be statistically not be different from 0.5 at least. In emerging markets, this could be different, okay? But uh, if the market is efficient, you can test the efficient market hypothesis using this methodology. It should be, in, if the market is efficient, then the slope should be 0.5, or it should be uh, at least, uh, if, you, if you account for, for, for uncertainty, it should be not different from 0.5 statistically. So I have, uh, now, now I give you a, a different uh, example. So now we have here, uh, I simulate an uh, autocorrelated process. And I have here, I'm operating with a positive autocorrelation, auto, auto and this uh, guy here, this A, is 0.9. Yeah, so it's a, again, it's a persistent process. It takes a long time until this process goes back, and until it has mean revert it, okay? Mm, again, I, sim I, I simulated 12,000 drawings and then I cut off the first 2,000 drawings so that the process is well behaving, okay? Because it needs some time until, until it's, it's well behaving. So what's going on here? So again, I consider the first 100 observations and I check what's the maximum here and what's the minimum here. So if I have the first 100 observations in this process here, maximum is 251 and minimum is 151. So the difference between maximum and minimum is 100. If I take a look on the global maximum and minimum, the global maximum is 289, which is here in the beginning. And then, obviously, it, it goes below the mean here, or be below the zero, the, the zero line. Yeah, and here is the 
the, here we find the global, mini, the global minimum, which is equal to minus 1,359. So the, so the spread between the global maximum and minimum is 1,648. And that is much larger than 10 times the range in the beginning, which is 100. 10 times 100 is 1,000, okay? 1,648 is much, much larger than what you would expect if that data would be independent distributed. But we know, of course, by construction, okay? By construction, we know that the data is not independent distributed. Yeah? We have an outer, an outer, outer correlated process. It's highly dependent, a highly dependent process here. And this is also reflected here, yeah? Because if it would be independent, this should be an equal or less sign, okay? And here it's much, much larger. So if we have dependency, what we can also already now, now, now infer from that, from that picture here, from that graph here, if we have a high level of, of dependency, the range of the global maximum minus minimum is much larger than the factor of, of 10 here. So this, this, this line here that we, that we had here, yeah, that's 0.5. This, this should be steeper. Yeah. So in here, I have, uh, I made some simulations again, and here, th this line here in the middle, this, is, this holds for, for an independent process, yeah, like we had earlier. So the, the slope is here, this, the uh, 0, 0.5. So the, the uh, total sample, or the, the, the expanded sample divided by the initial sample, so the, the multiplication factor should be the relation of the extended sample divided by the initial sample to the power of 0.5, or the square root of, of that relation. For a, a process that is highly persistent, the slope here is much steeper. It should be larger than 0.5. Here I have, a, I have simulated a process that has 0.75, for instance. Yeah? You see, it's much steeper slope. So if you have to multiply the, the initial sample by, by, by a much larger factor, because maximum, the range of maximum and minimum that you can expect increases, widen, it widens, if we have dependency. For an anti-persistent anti process, it's, it's the opposite. The slope is less than 0.5. Here I have simulated a process, or a product process, where the curve is uh, capital N over H to the power of 0.25. So, obviously, from an investment perspective, that's the least risky business, right? Because the, the range that you expect, as we ex that you can expect between minimum or maximum return, if you expand the sample, does not deviate that, um, that much from the initial range. Yeah. So, and we, we, we uh, now one, one thing uh, what we need to consider is if the data is well behaving per, and, and a persistent process, for, for a persistent process, the range should be less than one. Let me just put this away. So the slope, let's, let the slope, let us the slope denote as, as H, okay? Capital H. So this should be less than one, but larger than 0.1 if the process is persistent. And I give you 0.75 as an intuitive example because that's exactly between 0.5 and one. For an independent process, so a process that, that is neither persistent nor anti-persistent, this H should be 0.5. It, 
if the process is anti-persistent, what's the age? Should be less than 0.5, but larger than zero. So the slope age so should be defined between zero and one. Okay? Anti-persistent process between zero and 0 0.5, persistent process between 0 0.5 and one, and independent process like S&P 500 should be 0.5. And this brings us to the so-called rescaled range analysis. Yeah? And surprise, surprise, it was again Beno Mandelbrot who proposed this methodology. And this comes actually from, if you read his book, you will find that he, that he basically built, built this, uh, this methodology upon work from, from an engineer, uh, and his name was Hurst. And that, that's also why he owed this, this, this uh, function uh, to Hurst. Yeah? That, that, that's called the Hurst exponent, H. Uh, so, and, and if I remember correctly, uh, they, they were supposed to calculate uh, the, how, 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 how much the kneel is, is the, how, how much the water is increasing as we move from, from, from one direction to the others, to the other. So, it comes from, from, from natural science, from, from engineering science, actually, this kind of measurement, okay? And he modified it yeah, so, that, so that we can apply it for financial data as well. And so the, the rescaled range analysis is, is, is what you see here. Yeah? So, so we have an equation, Rs is the rescaled range for cluster K, for cluster size K, equal with C, times k to the power of h. And again, this, this Hurst exponent h is between 0 and 1. It's defined between 0 and, and 1. So on to, you estimate, you can estimate h by simply taking the logs on both sides, the natural logarithm. Yeah? So we have the, the natural logarithm of the rescaled range of, of cluster size k equal with the, the logarithm of c. And because of the rules for the logarithm, we can, we can put uh, the h becomes, you move it here as a multiplication factor times ln from k. And, we, and again, because it's a regression model, you have to include an, inter, uh, an error term u. And so we can, there's a simple OLS regression here, just in, lo in logarithms. So in, in, in his book, he, Mandelbrot argues uh, the, the uh, principal virtue of, the, of this our statistic is that it makes no assumptions about how the, or, or, how the or, or original data are organized. And this is a critical point when studying something like stock prices. Yeah, because there is evidence that the conventional assumptions of normally distributed errors or of, norm, of normally distributed returns are wrong. So the, uh, the statistic is defined as, as what you see here, and it took I took myself uh, some time to figure out what's actually going, going on here. Uh, so, so, but we will, we will talk, talk about it now, now in, in detail. So the important point is here. Okay, I should not touch it. So the, the, the important point is here that in your, your time series uh, data that you, that you use when you implement this methodology, it, it, it should be a multiple of two. And I, I have here one, one example. So if you let, let's say you, you have a data set of, of 1,050 observations. Okay? So you would run, this, you, you would run that strategy. You would, you, you would cut off uh, 26 observations, okay? Because you can, because you can only implement it in, then in, in, in this case, 4,024 observations. Yeah? If you have, let's say, 700 observations, then you need to cut off some of the, either, the, either from the beginning of the sample or from the end of the sample, because then you would need, you, could, you, you would implement it for 512 observations. So it, 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 you, will, you will see the logic soon. So let's say we, have, we are dealing with uh, 1,024 observations. Uh, then we can operate with eight categories. So the first category 
we, we take 2 to the power of, of 1, which is 2, obviously, and it means we divide the whole sample of 1024 by 2, which gives us 512 observations for each sample. The next cluster is 2 to the power of 2, which is 4. And in this iteration, we divide the whole data sample of 1024 into four clusters of 256 observations. And so on. Yeah? So if, if, if in, in, the, in the last cluster, in the eighth cluster, so it's 2 to the power of 8, yeah? so we, have then, we would then operate with, with data clusters of four observations. Yeah, so that's, that's basically how the, how the logic, logic is here. So you, you cluster the data, yeah? And you, if we have eight clusters or eight, eight uh, data categories, okay, it's, you, you, you have two as, as the base and you take it to the power of one, first one, then two, then three, then four, then five, then six, then seven. So it's a, it's a natural number, okay? These uh, categories need to be element of the natural numbers, obviously. And if we have eight categories, no? so eight, eight data points, the corresponding distribution for our errors here, yeah? so if you would do hypothesis testing, we can, we can obviously not operate with a, with a normal distribution here. Yeah? So in, if we have eight categories, it's, it's a t-distribution with six degrees of freedom yeah? because we have here an intercept term in the regression model and another parameter to estimate the Hertz exponent uh, so we lose two degrees of freedom, so we have eight minus two degrees of freedom. But we will, we will come back to that, but just as you, as you know. So basically what we do is, okay, let's go back here. We want to, we, we give a discrete representation of, of that curve here. So we, we have data and we break down the data, where is now the, the red, the red, uh, I have it here. So we, we, we try to break down this uh, continuous function, yeah, which looks like this. So we break it down into eight data, into eight data points, yeah, these eight categories will give us eight data points that are somewhere here on that curve. Yeah? So we get the representation of the continuous curve in terms of eight data points. Okay? Then we take the logarithm, and we, which has the purpose of making it linear, and then we can run simple OLS regression and get the slope of, of that curve, which is the Hurst exponent. That's, that's basically what we do here. What's, or what's, the, what's the purpose here of, of, of that analysis? So, and how, how does it work out in real life? So, again, so we have uh, eight different cluster categories, right? Uh, in the first iteration, we have two clusters, yeah, and then in each cluster are 512 observations, yeah, two samples. In the next cluster size, we have 256. So we have four, four clusters, yeah? and each cluster are four, 256 observations, and we do something with it. And then in the next iteration, in the third iteration, we have 128 observations in each cluster, yeah? and so on and so forth. So we do something here in an iterative manner for eight categories here, eight uh, cluster categories. So once you know what's happening in the first iteration, you know all the others. And luckily, we don't have to do it by hands, okay? We do all this in a, in a program. So in the, in the first iteration, again, we have, we have 1,024 observations. We cluster our data into two categories yeah, in the first iteration, and then each, uh, in each of these uh, data clusters, we have 512 observations. Right. 
what, what we do then is, okay, we, we, take, we take the first, let, let's say we have here uh, the time series evolution of, of some data. Yeah, here's capital T. So what, what we do is, okay, we take the first 512 observations, first cluster. So we subtract the sample mean, x bar here, from that first cluster here. We don't know what it is. We can just sub subtract it from that first sample, subsample here, okay. We take the d-mean observations and we compute the cumulative return, which can, be some, which can look something like that. Maybe. Who knows? Then we can take the, the maximum here and what's the minimum here? Yeah? Take the the max and the minimum from that first subsample here, yeah, that is then max minus minimum for the first subsample. And we do the same thing for the second subsample. Okay, we take the second subsample, we subtract the corresponding subsample mean here from the from the observation 513 un until 1024. Okay, then from the d mean observations, we compute the cumulative return, which maybe looks like that. Who knows? Again, we, we, we observe what is the maximum here. That is here. And what's the minimum? It's here. Okay, that's the minimum in, 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 in the data cluster here, which gives us then the uh, max minus mean. We can take the difference from that second uh, cluster. So then we have obviously two rescaled ranges uh, in, the, in the first iteration, and we take the average, the average of these two numbers. Uh, that's, that's what we see here. That's the first element, 1, 1, in our 8, eight by 2 data matrix. Uh, and the second element, 1, 2, is simply the logarithm of the length of the subsample data cluster, which is 512. And now you should know what's, what's happening in the next iteration, okay? Now we operate, in the next iteration, we operate with four clusters, okay? So we do the same thing, but having uh, four subclusters of that data sample, which is 1,024 observations, okay? We do the same thing. But then we take the average of four of these rescaled ranges. We have, we, have, we have four max minus minimum, okay? And we take the average of these four guys. And here is then the, simply the logarithm of 256, because that's then the, the corresponding subsample cluster size. And in the same manner, we, we do this until we reach uh, the eighth uh, cluster size, which is uh, four, yeah. So quite quite simple actually. So, and this gives us here in, 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 in this matrix here in, in vector notation, okay, we can denote this first vector here as uh, Rs bar. And this vector here, second as, as simply as, as K. So that's what we get from this analysis here. And actually I made a tutorial for you, so for those of you who are, who want to use it, you, you can, in this tutorial that I, that I provided you, uh, I think I, I do, this, do, do this in MATLAB, but you can do this also, you don't need MATLAB for that, okay? So you, you, you can also do that in simply in, in Excel. And there's actually a link that I gave you from, from uh, one guy, in the, I think he's an Australian guy, uh, who uh, shows you how to do that, uh, how to implement this, this methodology in, in Excel, yeah, so, but, uh, the main thing is that you understood, uh, that you understand what, what's going on here. So what, what we can then do, and, and again now recall, what, what we do is a log-log regression, okay? So what we do is we regress the, the first column vector, Rs, this guy here, yeah, on K, including a constant term, yeah? So we can define the matrix X and X has a eight by one vector of consisting only of ones, 
And in the second column vector, we, we have here this, this guy here. It's also an 8 by 1 vector. Yeah? We can define that. And what we do then is simply uh, an OLS regression. And the point estimate is then for, for, for beta hat h yeah, is then simply given by x transposed x inverted times x transposed rs bar. Quite simple. So, and, and what you get then, obviously, this, this uh, beta, beta hat h, okay, this is a 2 by 1 vector. First element, 1, 1, is the point estimate for the, con for the constant term in that, in that regression model here. Okay, if we go back, uh, it's, it's this guy here, the, the logarithm of capital C. But this is not important. We are not interested in that. We want to know the Hirsch exponent. So the second element in that vector is the is this guy here, the Hirsch exponent, h. Yeah, so that's how, how we would do that. And, and, and even that you can do in Excel. You, could, you can do it in, in, in Excel. Once you have the, the log log plot in Excel, you can add a linear regression model in, in Excel. So, and, and of course, you, you know, you might remember from, from econometrics, so the residual process here, it's, it's, it's not normally distributed, but because we have only eight observations, and we lose two degrees of freedom because we have, we have to estimate the intercept term and the Hirsch exponent, okay? So the corresponding reference distribution for making hypothesis tests is the T distribution with six degrees of freedom. It was a slightly it was a fatter tail than, than the normal distribution. So the critical values are slightly different. So on, using the critical values of the T distribution with six, with six degrees of freedom, we can do hypothesis tests. which is also what we come, come back to soon. So uh, here is one example. Uh, what, what, uh, because you, you might wonder, okay, Hirsch exponent, okay, Hirsch exponent, uh, is, that, is that really important? Uh, so what is, it, what is it actually measuring here where the, the, the uh, Hirsch exponent, it, it suggests correlations uh, that decrease very slowly so that they basically do not seem to vanish as you go back in time. And then you might run, okay, do we need that for financial market data? Well, in, in here, um, Mandelbrot gives us an example, okay, in, from, from, from 1982. It was before you were born, right? So, so uh, this IBM, uh, it was back in the days the, 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 the largest uh, computer company, yeah? And uh, then this, 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 this company, what, I mean, you can read it by by yourself, okay? So what he actually means here, you, you have it in, in, in the slides, right? And this is a direct citation, so you can just go through it. So, so what he means is here, okay, some things that, that happened back in the days have still an impact on the stock price today. Okay, if IBM had not made the decision here, it, it, it would most likely have a very different stock price, the development or stock price evolution from what it had. So, uh, and there's another example that, that, that I can give you from, 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 from my own observation, because when, when, I, when I read that book from, from, from Mendelbrot about IBM, then, well, I remembered another situation in the, in the, in the late 90s when uh, Nokia was uh, on the rising edge and telecom telecommunication companies worldwide were actually somehow on the rising edge, but not all of them, okay. So, um, in Finland, it was Nokia, which stock price skyrocketed in the, in, the, in the late 90s, until then, obviously, in the early 2000s, when it, when it crashed. Uh, and in Germany, it was the, the Deutsche Telekom, which was sort of the same company like Nokia. So, that, so, so it was a tele telecommunication company. And if I remember correctly, the uh, initial stock price was something like 20 euro, or something like that. It, it was in the, in, the, in the neighborhood of 20 euro. And then the stock price increased, skyrocketed, like, and it, was, it, it reached 100, more than 100 euros in the late 90s. So, uh, but then the management, they, they made a very poor decision. So they, they acquired in the US some, some telecommunication company. And obviously that company sucked somehow and uh, uh, it, 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 it didn't 
generate the profits that the Deutsche Telekom maybe have ha had expected from that acquisition. And uh, in, the, in the wake of that, all right, uh, what happened, so Deutsche Telekom, so okay, let's see here, stock price, capital, time capital T, so 1999, all right, Deutsche Telekom, here, here we have 20, 20 euros, uh, stock price in, increased, here it was about, I don't know, let's say 120. Uh, after that, stock price decreased, and it was actually, it, it decreased below this 20 euros, okay? And it never went, went, went up again to the, to the old highs, okay? So if they would have not done that poor, poor decision, maybe the stock price would have here either developed like that, or the crash would have not been that extreme like it, like it was the case. So stock price, the evolution of the stock price would have been different than it had been because of this poor, poor business that they have performed. So pretty much the same of what we can think of what has happened here to, to IBM or many other companies that, that make poor, poor decisions. Of course, a poor, a, a poor decision or a good decision have an impact on the evolution of the future stock price. So uh, that's what the Hearst exponent actually uh, can capture as opposed to, to correlation-based methods that cannot. So we, lack, we run a little bit out of time, uh, but anyway, so let's, let's uh, move on here. Uh, just a couple of slides left. So now I consider here, I simulated again uh, RIA1 process. Again, we operate here with RIA1 processes because we want to keep life simple, right? So uh, again, it's a very simple RIA1 process uh, and I uh, simulate here 1,024 observations. And then what do I do? I estimate the Hurst exponent for each of these uh, autocollation processes. And I estimate uh, a large variety of autocollated processes, so I, I start with autocollation of minus 0.9, which gives me an a anti-persistent process, right? Then minus 0.8, and so on. So I, I take steps of one decimal after, after, after the comma, right? So from minus 0.9 until 0.9. And then for each time series, I simulate 1,024 observations. I know the corresponding point estimate for for the autocollation parameter A, yeah, because I have simulated, so I, I know what I have used, right? And then I use the simulated data to estimate the Hurst exponent using that formula. And what you, when, this is what you get out of it. Here, I plot, it. I plot the, the Hurst exponent depending on the uh, autocorrelation parameter. And it's maybe not surprising yeah, that, 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 that they are co positively correlated. Yeah? So Hurst exponent and autocorrelation parameter are positively correlated. Co the correlation between H and alpha, uh, between H, uh, H and A is 0.99 in rounded figure. So yeah, almost, almost perfectly correlated. Uh, but yeah, we see that the range does not cover the whole the whole range, of the, so the range for the Hurst exponent does not cover the whole range that the Hurst exponent can cover. For instance, um, for the most anti-persistent time series of uh, these autocorrelation auto processes, where we have an autocorrelation parameter of minus 0.9, okay, we have a point estimate for the Hurst exponent of 0.39, right? It's less than 0.5, yeah? So it's, it tells us this, this, this process is anti-persistent, right? But it could be more anti-persistent, right? Because a, a process that has a Hurst exponent of 0.2, for instance, should be much more anti-persistent as an autocollation process that has an autocollation parameter of minus 0.9. On the other hand, if we have an autocorrelation parameter of, of, of 0.9, which gives us a persistent process, as we have seen, the corresponding Hurst exponent for that series is 
Uh, so the range of the Hurst exponent here is less than the range of the autocollation parameters here. That is an interesting finding, right? So what does it mean? So let's consider now some, some real life data. So there's a web page here, what you see here, if you, if you push that button, then you will see uh, that S&P, Sun and Poos, they have published a list of survival stocks that, 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 that were constituted companies in the S&P 500 in March 1957 and that have survived 50 years in the S&P 500. So what, what, what I have done with, with some colleagues from uh, Texas A&M University, okay, uh, they have this CRISP database, so we collected data and we figured out, okay, 92, we, we could identify 92 original constitute companies. So now we, now we have to think, you will get a different figure here if you, if you read that, that, uh, that uh, statement here. Uh, the, the reason is because there were, of course, mergers and acquisitions, uh, and acquisitions happening yeah, in the time. So, but we could break it down um, to 92 original stock companies. So, and then I wanted to have 1,024 monthly observations. So, and I've, I figured out that from these 92 original constitute companies, there were 40, uh, 34 that had uh, re return entries in the CRISP database um, going back to September 1934. Yeah, because the sample, obviously, it ended in December 2019. Yeah? And if I want to have 1,024 monthly data observations, yeah, I have to go back into time, into to September 1934. So, and actually that data, that, or that original data here, this, this 92 stocks, I used actually also here in, the, uh, in one of my studies, yeah? entitled Better Not Forget. Uh, so what, what, what I did then is, okay, I fitted uh, RR1 models, to, of, to uh, all of these 34 uh, survivor stocks. And I, I, I figured out that 22 out of 34, they executed a negative point estimate for first order autocorrelation parameter. And again, we have discussed this earlier today uh, because of this short term re reversal effect. Okay, that's the short term reversal effect that you should find in the data. So uh, for nine out of, out of these 22 stocks, uh, the point estimates were statistically significantly, because the t statistics were uh, less than minus 1.96. Yeah, now we have to, again, we have to go back and we have to think in what traditional finance, finance scholars uh, think. So, and then I estimated first exponents for these nine firms. And now you will be hopefully surprised, because the first exponents for these firms that had a, a negative first order autocorrelation, or significantly negative, the Hirsch exponent was positive. From the simulation experiment, we have seen that the Hirsch exponent should be, no, the Hirsch exponent should be less than 0.5, okay? Because in the presence of, of, of negative autocorrelation, the Hirsch exponent should be less than 0.5 because we have anti-persistence, right? But here, the Hirsch exponent is higher than, than 0.5. It reaches actually 0.65 here. So it's between something between 0 .50, 0 0.54 and 0.64. So it, it indicates persistency, even though the first order autocorrelation suggests anti-persistency. So well, what does it mean? So it means that statistically significant negative autocorrelation does not necessarily imply anti-persistence in, in the data. So, so we can see here at, 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 at times negative auto, first order auto, autocorrelation can be associated with highly persistent processes, which is what we see here. So, and it, it, it also means that the Hurst exponent and autocorrelation, they, they measure two different kinds of dependencies. 
So the, the, the Hearst exponent, it, it can measure something that, that autocorrelation models can, cannot measure. And what, I, and what I did here is, okay, I, I, I estimated the Hearst exponent for uh, all those, all those uh, stocks that, that had a, a positive but not significant autocorrelation. Okay, I think it was, uh, don't remember, you can count it. Well, 12 stocks, okay, from these uh, 34 stocks. They, they had a, a positive autocorrelation, but it was statistically not different from zero. Okay, but we see here that the Hearst exponent suggests uh, it, it's between 0.6 and 0.67. And if we make hypothesis tests, okay, if we, if we estimate, if we, if we, if we uh, consider the, the corresponding uh, t-test t for this first exponent, we will see, or we, what, we will, what we will see is that the uh, value of the Hurst, that, that the, uh, the test statistic has a, has a critical, has a, has a value that is larger than, than three for all of these guys here. In, and it, at, and it, it implies that the Hurst exponent is significant. So we are dealing with significant dependencies here, with a significant dependency structure for all of these 12, 12 assets. Even though first order autocorrelation auto, auto suggests there is no uh, dependency. And okay, well, what we see here is okay, if we if you run the the, if you uh, have the, the, the corresponding test statistic for, for the Hurst exponent, okay, uh, you have to compare that value with the t distribution with six degrees of freedom. If you would take a t test, a simple t test, and we would have the normal distribution, we would have a, we, we, we would compare the, the corresponding value with 1.65. Because what we do here is, okay, we, we, we do not test if we do a test if H is zero, as we do in many other tests. What, what we test is, okay, we are interested in dependency, okay? So, uh, you should not confuse this test with a, with a standard T test you know, that we usually have uh, or, 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 or discuss for, for standard regression models. So, Let's say we have a point estimate of, of 0.6. We want to know is, is, the, is the, the dependency significant from 0.5. So it's 0.6 minus 0.5. Yeah? This, is, this is what we test. That's our test statistic lambda, lambda hat. And then we divide it by the standard deviation from the whole Hurst exponent. And, and this is what we get from the, re, from the regression model. Yeah? So we, 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 uh, we, we test dependency versus independency. And we do not test if, if, the, if H is equal to zero, okay? We test is H equal with 0.5 because we know that 0.5 tells us, okay, the data is independent. Yeah. So here we will test, okay, if we know the point estimate is 0.6, then we will test, okay, uh, H is larger than 0.5 versus H is 0.5. And, the course, and what we do is here a one-sided test, okay? One-sided test. And, and one-sided test, the, the critical values are different. For the normal distribution is 1.65 as opposed to 1.95 if we have a, a, a two-sided test, right? But if we have a T distribution with only six degrees of freedom, the critical value moves to 1.94, okay? So that's our critical value for the one-sided test using a t-distribution with six degrees of freedom. So in the assignment, I could, for instance, ask, okay, I could, uh, I could argue, okay, you have 10 clusters, okay? What's the corresponding distribution for testing the uh, Hurst exponent? It's then t distribution with eight degrees of freedom, right? It's ten minus two, eight. Then you have to figure out what's the what's the critical value. Then you can ask either chat, chat uh, GPT or you can just check a table 
that you find in, in Google, and you can then find the corresponding critical values for that distribution. Yeah. So hopefully this is, this is clear to everybody. Uh, yeah, this is actually what I wanted to tell you today. If there are any questions, you can ask now or next time. Next time is also an excellent time point for, for asking questions, or you can drop an email, and then we can. Uh, I will discuss this then here, of course, in the in the audience. But this is what I would like to what I would like to have discussed today. Yeah. So I wanted to give you a new uh, a new view on on dependencies, uh, how to measure dependencies of financial assets. And what also is interesting, maybe, so what would you expect? What's the relationship of, of there's obviously a relationship between Paolo exponent and Hirsch exponent, which is something what Mandelbrot uh, also uh, argues in his book, but he does not specify it, so it's obviously quite complicated. But uh, um, what you can think of, so if, if data is persistent, so the, the higher the economic magnitude of the Hearst exponent, the lower should be the economic magnitude of the power law exponent. Because what does power law exponent tell us? So if the, if the, exponent, if the power law exponent is, is, is very low, yeah, it tells us, okay, we have a lot of observations that do not really matter, but then we have all of a sudden these, these, these huge summer deviations, these huge... Uh, these extreme events happening. So if a, if a process is persistent, so if the, if the, if the, if the, if the Hertz exponent is, let's say, 0.9 or 0.8, and the if a stock price is very persistent, it, it would be, you, you could really, really earn money if the trend would, would go on forever. Yeah? So at some point, the more persistent the stock price, uh, or the, the more persistent the, evo the evolution of the, of, the, of the stock price is, the more the correction must be. Otherwise, you could earn money in stocks, right? So the, there's a dual relationship between the Hearst exponent and the Paolo exponent, and, uh, and, 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 and this is so that if the, the higher the Hearst exponent, the lower should be the, the uh, corresponding Paolo exponent. Yeah? So if, the, if you believe, so if, if data is, is very persistent, then the, the, the large correction or the, the, the last standard deviation should be much more severe as if the data is anti-persistent. Because if data is anti-persistent and, and always bounces back to the mean, there is no huge correction necessary, okay? So the, if the Hearst exponent is close to, is, is, is let's say 0.3 or 0.4, yeah, the, the power exponent can be much much uh, in, in, its, in, its, in its magnitude much larger, which implies much less extreme events. Yeah, so, so that's basically uh, uh, all what I wanted to cover today, and these are the methodologies that I wanted to, 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 give, to give you in, in, in this course, and uh, next, next time we will discuss uh, potential uh, questions for the assignment. Yeah? And, uh, Hopefully, if, if, if you have some, some questions, just drop me an email so that I can discuss this then for all of you uh, next, next time. Thank you.